What's going on guys? Read and Reflect here. Uh, this video is kind of on the fly and I actually have quite a bit I would like to read, but I'll be talking mainly about Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson and Friedrich Nietzsche and a common message they share, which people have called uh, a sort of vehement individualism that uh, we should both applaud free spirits when they have something to uh, say or do that enriches the world, but also more fundamentally than that, even apart from the outwardly exceptional human being who stands apart from the lot of men because his character is eccentric or his accomplishments are eccentric. Quite apart from that, uh, Emerson has this fantastic and brief book by the name of Self-Reliance, and it's an easy favorite of mine, and I may possibly re return to it sometime here on this channel. I will surely be returning to Emerson himself in some of my future videos. I haven't done really any, I don't know that I've mentioned him at all in all of my videos, and yet he's uh, easily a favorite writer and human being of mine. Just when I first read this book, it just, I felt such an intimate connection with Emerson, and he had just said so eloquently beautifully what all my life I had waited in vain to hear, but that I think is perhaps the most important message an individual can receive. And so I have a little bit I want to read. I'm just going to read the first couple of pages, and then I'll try to reflect on it. I have a little passage from Nietzsche I want to read. I'm supposed to be having a podcast with a friend of mine very, very shortly in fact, in a matter of minutes, uh, within the hour, basically, and so I'm trying to get through this as quickly as possible, while also doing justice to the integrity of the motif and the message that both of these men had to offer to humanity, and I may mention some others as I go along. I read the other day some verses written by an eminent painter, which were original and not conventional. The soul always hears an admonition in such lines. Let the subject be what it may. The sentiment they instill is of more value than any thought they may contain. I like that. Just the idea that the manner of one's expressing certain things may be more valuable and more inspiring than the actual ideas that, say, this poet-painter had. To believe your own thought, to believe that what is true for you in private, in your private heart, is true for all men. That is genius. Speak your latent conviction, and it shall be the universal sense. For the inmost in due time becomes the outmost. And our first thought is rendered back to us by the trumpets of the last judgment. Reference to Christianity there. Familiar as the voice of the mind is to each, the highest merit we ascribe to Moses, Plato, and Milton is that they set at naught books and traditions and spoke not what men, but what they thought. Here you have all of these either formative or, in any case, influential figure, figures in Western society and culture. And why we praise them is because rather than use other people, the ideas of other people and institutions as a kind of crutch to justify one's own opinions, which really properly then would not be your own, one goes out on a limb and ventures to posit what one alone has individually 
come to realize that one's own insights that have been arrived by oneself and nobody else. This is a theme that we'll find in both the readings that I have selected out today is that the individual sees what nobody else sees and has capacities and wisdoms and talent, all of those things that nobody else has. And I, Emerson just seems to teach the reader to pursue whatever that intrinsic individuality is and to perfect it and not distrust it. Uh, he also, at the very beginning, has this Latin quote, Nete quasi veris extra. And before doing this, I, I had been thinking about make, making this video earlier today. I was wondering who coined that statement because it doesn't say, and I had looked on Google and I I just looked very quickly, not very thoroughly, and I couldn't find out where that Latin quotation came from. But translated in English, it means seek nothing beyond yourself. And that, that is Emerson in a nutshell, and Nietzsche as well, and we could say Thoreau. We could name quite a few people that uh, have this unbreakable conviction about the self-sufficiency, the self-adequacy of a person, that you don't need anything else to justify your existence, or all existence. You don't need any special kind of beliefs or opinions, but just as you are and as you already move through life, uh, you're perfectly justified, and you do deserve to live a life uh, of appreciation of the fact that we found ourself, ourselves in existence and that we have opportunity to make unique contributions to the world because we see the world in ways that nobody else does. A man should learn to detect and watch that gleam of light which flashes across his mind from within, more than the luster of the firmament of bards and sages. Yet he dismisses without notice his thought, because it is his. In every work of genius we recognize our own rejected thoughts. They come back to us with a certain alienated majesty. Great works of art have no more affecting lesson for us than this. They teach us to abide by our spontaneous impression with good-humored inflexibility than most when the whole cry of voices is on the other side. And uh, it's interesting there in the last few sentences, he's almost saying that the work that the genius carries out is the easiest thing for him to do, and yet because he is going out on a limb and positing uh, individual opinions and attitudes, what have you, whatever it is that makes him a unique person in the world, you have nobody on your side. Unless, perchance, the people that hear what you say or think or uh, what sort of services you're performing and what you do, what it is you do, if there is anybody that comes to recognize you f really for what you are and get past maybe any prejudices that they could have about you, it's, uh, it's, you're quite alone in living the way that you uniquely are, and it's, at least going to take a lot of time before anybody sides with you, so to speak, and even that is not ensured. You might uh, be following your heart, your will, your instinct, as they naturally lead you, and uh, you may earn the enmity or the dislike 
of other people for doing what you love and what is natural to you. Great works of art have no more affecting lesson for us than this. They teach us to abide by our spontaneous impression with good humored inflexibility than most when the whole cry of voices is on the other side. Else, tomorrow, a stranger will say with masterly good sense precisely what we have thought and felt all the time, and we shall be forced to take with shame our own opinion from another. There is a time in every man's education when he arrives at the conviction that envy is ignorance, that imitation is suicide, that he must take himself for better, for worse, as his portion, that through the wide universe is, oh, though the wide universe is full of good, no kernel of nourishing corn can come to him but through his toil bestowed on that plot of ground which is given to him to till. And uh, I can't remember if this is the one that I said before, but this is a d definite motif that is very recurring in both Emerson and Nietzsche is that the fate of each human being or where we each individually find ourselves in time and history is so profoundly and unspeakably unique. And to both of them, maturity, the maturity of a human being would entail a full recognition of the ground one has been given to till and to till it and to recognize that you have been endowed with a unique position, a unique lot in life, and that you can cultivate it and you can contribute to it and make it fuller, uh, better or worse, Lee, and if you can do it better and really make contributions to the world, to life, then uh, so much the better for everybody. But it takes recognizing our unique experiences, the unique life that we each individually find ourselves in, and then once we have recognized the total situation and what sorts of things we might be able to do, what sorts of things we might be good at, what kinds of impressions we could leave on other people that would, you know, prevent them for take prevent them from taking turns for the worse in character and not being toxic, not being rude and stingy and mean, but uh, perhaps being creative, innovating certain things in your own way, uh, exploring the ideas that present themselves to you, and really. Uh, perfecting your own kind of art of living. And both Nietzsche and Emerson wholly believed in the art of the individual perfecting, or as Nietzsche would say, poetizing the happenings of his everyday life and his missions for what he wants to do to uh, change the world, because we all can't help but change the world, even if the last decision a person makes is to end his own life, that he still makes that very change of uh, ending his life. And uh, that just is the inevitable circumstance of living as a human is that we have to, we have to change things and we have a strange manner of being able to consider possibilities, do this or do that. And we gravitate to certain ones. We have our own distinct way of thinking about these choices. And uh, whether you believe in free will or determinism, it's we still have to look at the fact of forethought and that we think about things before we do them and see that things could go this way as opposed to that. And just the mere fact that we premeditate on things is very curious and it's basically I'm getting at how weird thought itself is and I think we overlook this 
Anyway, I'm going to finish Emerson very quickly so I can get on to Misha. The power which resides in him is new in nature, and none but he knows what that is which he can do, nor does he know until he has tried. Not for nothing one face, one character, one fact, makes much impression on him, and another none. This sculpture in the memory is not without pre-established harmony. The eye was placed where one ray should fall, that it might testify of that particular ray. There you go, the particularity of our fate and the things that we as individuals see. And we can make unique contributions based on the unique things that we see. We but half express ourselves and are ashamed of that divine idea which each of us represents. It may be safely trusted as proportionate and of good issues, so it be faithfully imparted. But God will not have his work made manifest by cowards. A man is relieved and gay when he has put his heart into his work and done his best. But what he has said or done otherwise shall give him no peace. It is a deliverance which does not deliver. In the attempt, his genius deserts him. No muse befriends, no invention, no hope. Beautiful, beautiful. Since I was young, I had this distinct feeling of a kind of internal necessity. And with that, I had some strange experiences, some of them dreams, some of them in the daytime. And uh, something about them struck me as having a kind of mystical aspect. And just as long as I can remember, this is basically the greatest interest of mine. It's also perhaps the most dangerous in interest a person can have. And some say that is what took Nietzsche out and led him to a psychotic break is that infatuation with the free, the spiritual, inner, imaginative side of man and unusual states and experiences, and he uh, quite apparently was a person who just experienced these sorts of states uh, of what he, in Birth of Tragedy, describes as intoxication, and he considered this the necessary precursor of all art, is that he goes so far as to say that no art can be carried out at all unless one has had, one is somehow involved in that intoxicated state of life, the kind of ecstasy and ecstasy, the standing beyond, standing outside of oneself, I believe is the old, the definition of the old Greek word. And I think that just pours through all of Emerson's work and Nietzsche's is that they undoubtedly had some very profound experiences. They were uh, curious about, passionate about the spiritual side of man and the possibility of the development of our species, but that we can't hope for this in the mass of man, it's pulcrum est paucorum hominum is a little Latin saying that Nietzsche says at least once in one of his books. I can't remember where exact. I, I, I think it's in Beyond Good and Evil. Uh, and it means beauty is for the few. And there may be detected a kind of arrogance there that only a handful of people really get to live and get to see and experience the best stuff you can see and experience. And as for the rest, they have a muted and 
kind of animalistic and robotic, what have you, existence less than human, whereas you have this subpopulation of higher men, uber menschen, uh, a kind of aristocracy who have the pleasure of being able to access profound and incredibly significant states spiritually that uh, it may sound arrogant, but I think that even just a sober look at the world, at society, and how they function naturally shows that uh, most people seem to be concerned rather than with beauty with uh, expediency functionality just a safe and reliable day where it's, everything is kind of structured and I go to work from this time to this time and then I go to this place and have a couple of drinks maybe I uh, just all of these safe and regular things, and then one wonders, or any way someone who has had profound experience wonders, where in all of this is the concern for uh, the heavenly, the mystical, the beautiful, the mysterious, all of these contemplative joys in states that the individual alone can attain to, and I think in their emphasis of just how individual are our own individual experiences as individuals, individual, individual, that only the man himself as a single unit can really attain to these profound states of contemplation that change him as a person and keep his horizons open and wide and keep him engaged with the reality in which we live is I try I don't try actually it seems to just happen very naturally and I've always had such an inclination to appreciate the simple experience of life that I have, or rather all the simple many experiences of life that I have, that as we get older, there seems to be learned this kind of numbness to experience, and also a kind of overlooking of all that we experience, and we're no longer drinking in uh, the possible glories of many of the things that we could find in our experiences, if only we learned to look at them properly. Aldous Huxley has a book called The Art of Seeing. I bought it some time ago expecting that it would have something to do with basically becoming a visionary and maybe certain little tricks that one could carry out so that uh, you do attain to the spiritual state that is told about by mystics and saints and all of that. But rather, Huxley had some actual physical ocular problems with his, with his tangible eyes. And he had made this book at a very young age, I believe, to uh, help other people who had these physical eye problems and give them certain uh, practices they could do or just talk about the science of the human eyes and its composition and all that stuff so that people could better take care of their eyes. Whereas I had bought it thinking that he was going to teach you to do some pretty magical things with your mind and spirit. But 
that is a veritable aspect of Huxley himself is that like Emerson and like Nietzsche, he was utterly preoccupied with spiritual existence and the possibility of man's, individual man's, attaining to what he called the unitive knowledge of the deity, that that is an utterly real possibility for each individual man and that unless he takes the steps or okay I suppose takes the steps uh, toward seeing properly and there's this book called Practicing the Presence of God which Huxley cites in some of his essays and I think that is, I have not read that book myself, but I think that is a certain practice that you can view the everyday happenings of your life either in a, a crude and a lackluster sort of light, or you can instill what you see with that luster and see God, so to speak, rest in the kingdom of God and just have that certainty of life's mystery and brilliance all of the time, even in what at first strikes you as repulsive or boring or not interesting, just learning to bring in the fresh view all that you see on an everyday basis. So I'm basically out of time. My friend's probably looking for me, so... I just want to read a little bit of Nietzsche and then I'll draw it to a close. A traveler who had seen many countries and peoples and several continents was asked what human traits he had found everywhere, and he answered, men are inclined to laziness. Some will feel that he might have said with greater justice, they are all timorous. They hide behind customs and opinions. At bottom, Every human being knows very well that he is in this world just once as something unique and that no accident, however strange, will throw together a second time into a unity such a curious and diffuse plurality. He knows it, but hides it like a bad conscience. Why? From fear of his neighbor who insists on convention and veils himself with it. But what is it that compels the individual human being to fear his neighbor, to think and act herd fashion, and not to be glad of himself? Both of them, Emerson and Nietzsche, strongly suggested that people be more glad of themselves. Because they spoke of, or well, Nietzsche did in any case, but it pours through Emerson's writings taught an affirmation of life and that includes everything about it it's yourself and all that maybe beforehand you thought to be sorts of arguments against life that prove its uh unworthiness and its lack of having any special value rather learning to appreciate all that either by convention or your first impulses, one is led not to appreciate about life. A sense of shame, perhaps. Here, let me read the question again. From fear of his neighbor who insists on convention and veils himself with it. But what is it that compels the individual human being to fear his neighbor, to think and act herd fashion and not to be glad of himself? A sense of shame, perhaps, in a few rare cases. In the vast majority, it is the desire for comfort, inertia. In short, that inclination to laziness of which that traveler spoke. He is right. Men are even lazier than they are timorous. Timorous being fearful. And what they hear, what they fear most is the troubles with which any unconditional honesty and nudity would burden them. 
and I think this is so, so true, is that just by being perfectly honest with people, you are putting yourself into the greatest danger. <laughs> Only artists hate this slovenly life in borrowed manners and loosely fitting opinions and unveil the secret, everybody's bad conscience, the principle that every human being is a unique wonder. They dare to show us the human being as he is, down to the last muscle, himself and himself alone. Even more, that in this rigorous consistency of his uniqueness, he is beautiful and worth contemplating, as novel and incredible as every work of nature, and by no means dull. Yeah, and uh, Emerson said on the very first page of self-reliance that in every great work of genius, we see our own neglected thoughts. And Nietzsche here is saying that by being an individual, not enslaving oneself to conventions as one's neighbor has and speaking the words that they like to hear, and expect you to say, rather going out on a limb and being yourself, is that makes you the bad conscience of the people. You become a living, uh, a living vessel for all of the thoughts and notions and convictions that people have in themselves vanquished, and these pertain greatly to a kind of free moving and self-expression in the world and pursuing one's genius, recognizing what one could be good for and just going for it and not worrying about what others think and uh, and I would basically say living as eccentrically as one's existence truly is, as both Emerson and Nietzsche have said in this very video, is that they're, to them, I, I'm putting words in their mouth here, it's no direct quote, but I think that both of them thought that most people don't live as eccentrically as is their own individual existence, and if they really properly recognize just how individual their own life is, the individuality of how they experience life, then maybe they would be more individual in their character and express unique things, make unique contributions. I have a couple of quotes I really want to read quick, but I'm very, very short on time. I'm actually... Yep, my friend is literally texting me saying, where are you at? I'm so sorry, dude. I really wanted to make this video. Uh, Tung Shan, uh, ancient philo Eastern philosopher, I believe, of the Tao, he says, if you look for truth outside yourself, it gets farther and farther away. We're going to skip that one. Uh, from the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu says, if one doesn't trust himself, how can he trust anyone else? And just beginning, all of these kind of Eastern quotes of beginning at home and establishing trust with yourself and that way you can move through life and not be caught up in crippling fear all the time, but you can actually get things done. And Nietzsche was a great fan of Schopenhauer. I wanted to talk about him a little bit more in this video because he too speaks of the value of the individual and that he really sees things that no one else could possibly see and he is capable of making his own unique contributions. But that to live as individually as you truly are as a unitary human being requires that, here, Schopenhauer has a quote. Do I have it here? It says, talent hits a target. Talent hits a target no one else can hit. 
genius hits a target no one else can see. And so basically he's saying the formula for becoming a genius is to go for the target that you alone can see. You have some kind of dream, some vision of something that could possibly brought, be brought into this world, something you could possibly accomplish, but because no one else sees what you're going for, it can make you look kind of crazy and eccentric. And I'll end here. Schopenhauer says, to live alone is the fate of all great souls. And for those who have read World as Representation and Will, uh, Welt als Villa und Vorstellung. Schopenhauer talks there about the pure subject of knowing and how this is something like contemplative vision and the place that artists get to to uh, create what it is that they create. And we are capable of attaining to these pure states of observation and participation in our own experience. And everything can become an object of aesthetic contemplation and he basically teaches that the individual alone can attain to these heightened states, get to this pure awareness and pure admiration of some aesthetic phenomenon or some even everyday happening. So either in the appreciation of works of art or in the appreciation of your everyday, it's there's a certain pure subjectivity that one can attain to where you can freshly admire whatever it is that you're looking at, and it could be anything. But he taught that only individuals can get to this, and to hope for such an exalted state of man in the crowd or in the mass is it can't be done. And so Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, Emerson, all really uh, condoned this individuality of the person and each of us pursuing our own genius or making our own genius and Colin Wilson has this excellent book called The Outsider and there he talks about how every great visionary that's ever been attained to their uh, outstanding visions of life only in solitude and that without that ingredient of being with oneself and perhaps going through some doubt and despair and uh, not being sure what to do, but in the end, realizing what you're here to do and realizing that your nature tells you already what you ought to do. And there's a kind of given cycle to each and every day. And there are more or less poetic ways of moving about through these days. Wilson thought that men had to go alone to attain to this vision where everything takes on a kind of flair and splendor and you do attain to the ecstatic vision of the poet and you don't have to be a poet or a writer or a speaker any kind of particular dealer with words but nevertheless you have the kind of superpower of contemplating things and admiring what you see and also taking what you see so that you can make unique contributions to the world. So I'm going to go.